Hello everyone. Good evening. I hope you had a beautiful Shabbos and a great beginning of the week. I have to say that it's been very interesting beginning of the week for me and with God's help I'm going to have some news to share with you soon. Um, I have tremendous, tremendous faith that all is going to be very well and that my faith will come to you and bring you the blessings and the brachot that I want to share with you. And in our study of the Kabbalah of the Torah, I want to reiterate again so there are no conversations and there is no thinking for one second that what I'm doing is because I consider myself a Kabbalist. I do not, let's put it to you this way, I study, it's now my 10th cycle of complete Zohar, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and I don't know how many cycles of Torah, but one thing is for certain, if I can give you a little drop, a small, small droplet of the wisdom and the greatness of Torah in Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the companions, then my, my life is worth it. When I bring you Kabbalah, I bring you translation directly from the Zohar, the Sunchino Zohar, word for word, without any commentary, other than, of course, my own personal when I say so. In other words, when I finish a piece of Zohar, I have things to say, and those are mine. But in what I read to you, in what I share with you, just like in Torah, it's not a personal opinion, it's not a translation by me personally. We work with the Gutni Chumash. This is number one edition, Bereshit. And we work with Sonchino Zohar. The work is meticulous and I want it to be understood that that's the way it is and I accept nothing less than that. We're talking about the portion of Noach Parashat Noach. Parasha begins by saying Noach was a righteous man. He was perfectly righteous in relation to his generation. Noach walked only with God with the support of God. And he fathered Shem, Ham, and Yafet. What does that mean? Being righteous and walking only with God 
in his generation. The Chachamim our sages don't agree, don't agree, all of them, whether or not he was perfectly righteous or whether or not there is derogatory connotation, Rashi talks about, others interpret it derogatorily in comparison with his generation, which was a generation of depraved and corrupt, he was righteous. But if he had been in Avram's generation, he would not have been considered righteous at all. Now, what does this mean? The Zohar says, God told Noah that he was going to bring the flood and wipe out mankind. Noah was told that he and his family would be saved. He did not pray to God for the salvation of the rest of the world, and they were destroyed on the other hand, writes the Zohar, when the Jewish people worshipped the golden calf, Mo Moshe prayed, Moses prayed for them to be saved. It is an interesting conversation. Very interesting. Going with God walking with God, righteous in the generation, corrupt as it was, depraved as it was, Noah was the only one who walked with God. But he also did not do what Moshe Rabbeinu did and what a great leader should be doing for his generation. The very interesting thing, a few days ago, there was a video of Bibi Netanyahu that circulated in the world. And that was Netanyahu praying for the country, the health of the country, and the health of people afflicted by Corona. Interesting. I think it was Thursday or Friday, so it was before Shabbos that this video came out. I really don't think that this video of his was motivated by Parashat Noach, but that this video of his was motivated by the fact that he is a great leader and he is deeply concerned about what is going on and how it's going on in Eretz Israel and in the world. Because the prayer, basically, when you make a prayer and when you ask Hashem, you should always ask for the other first. And then if you have to ask for yourself, you can do that. But it's extremely, extremely important to pray for and to ask for and to implore Hashem for the others, for the world. At the beginning of all this, 
הרב שמואל אליהו, הרב ראשי של צפת, made a lot, a lot of appearances. And he said, the fact that it's all about us is not the way. It's all about us as human beings. And here, it's all about destroying the world, the earth became depraved and idolatrous before God and the earth became full of robbery. God saw the earth and look, it had become depraved of all human and animal flesh. Nature of the earth had become depraved. It's very interesting to understand that not only humans had become depraved, but that humans taught animals to be depraved. At the point when Hashem turns around and he said, the end of all flesh has come before me as the earth has become full of robbery because of them. Robbery not only meaning stealing, but robbery meaning that part of what is the most precious. And that is neshama, that is soul. The corruption, not only of material things, but the corruption of the depth of humanity, which is the soul. I am going to destroy them from the earth. You should make an ark. And here comes the incredible, the incredible, amazing discussion of how the ark should be built, what kind of wood should be used, how many stories it should have. Hashem tells us, and he told Noah exactly what and how to do it. Just like he told Moshe Rabbeinu exactly how to build the tabernacle. The incredibly amazing thing about Torah is the precision of what Hashem tells us he wants from us that he doesn't leave any detail open to conversation. He tells him, I want a light. You should make a window. What kind of need is there to tell him he should make a window? Why? Because he's going to need the window when it's time to send out the raven, to send out the dove, to know whether or not the earth had dried. And he tells him, ah, you should make a light for the ark. You should finish it slanting a cubic high at the top. You should place the entrance on the side of the ark. And you should make it with a bottom 
second and third story. You know, I never understand, never, and, and nobody can convince me, okay, that Tom, Dick, and Harry wrote Tyra. It's not possible. Like we talked last week, and we said, who created these? Give me an answer. Every scientific fact comes right back to the beginning. Who created the? I will set my covenant with you, and you will come into the ark. You, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Now, from every living demon and from all flesh, you should bring two of each species into the ark to keep alive with you. They shall be male and female. From the birds to their animal species and from the animals which have only bred with their own species. Don't bring me anything that has not. And from every creeping thing on the ground which has only bred with its own species, two of each will come to you of their own accord to be kept alive. As for you, take with you all from every edible food. It will be for you and for them to eat. This is clear instruction that Hashem is destroying the world because of its depravity. And he demands without a doubt and without translation and without needing to be more specific a male and a female, which has bred only with each other, not interbred, not with others, but only clean. This is an indication, then later on, of all of the conversation of forbidden relations. Which, which, two weeks ago was completely and totally taken apart by Benny Lau relation, relation to the chief rabbi of Israel, allowing and condoning and discussing change in Torah law that gay and lesbian contact I don't even want to say anything else, should be or is or shall be whatever permitted. When the Torah said, first of all, that there isn't such a thing and it's an abomination, let's leave that behind for one second, but let's say that Hashem, from the creation of the world and from every single 
law that has to do with anything, it's always male and female. It's always a unit and it's always his will to be so. The idea of changing a comma, a point, a letter in the Torah is not permitted under any circumstances. What is going on in this world? No. What is going on in the Jewish world? What is going on? in the religious world. It's beyond. And there is only conversation, the only thing that I can think of as an, I can't even say as an excuse because there, there is no such thing. Okay. But there is no such thing as changing Jewish law, as changing Torah, as changing the word of God. From all the species of the animals that are pure in Jewish law, you should take for yourself seven pairs of male and female, and from the species of animals that are not pure according to Jewish law, two male and female. No conversation necessary. You understand this. Also from the birds that are pure, seven pairs, male and female, to keep their seed alive on the face of the earth. For in another seven days, he says, I will make it rain upon the earth and for 40 days and 40 nights. And I will wash away off the face of the earth all existence that I have made. I, and not an angel, and not a seraph, but I, Hashem, God, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Those words exactly come again when B'nai Israel the children of Israel are to leave Egypt and the firstborn is slain in Egypt and Hashem says, not anyone else, only I will do, only I will be. Ein od milvado, there is none beside him. More than that, more than that. Hearing this from him, don't you shake for everything in your life that you do that excludes him. For everything that we do in our lives that closes the door to him. Everything that we think, everything that we destroy of his world. From the depth of the earth comes hot water. From the skies, the rain, the well springs of the great depth burst forth, the apertures of the skies 
opened up. What is there in what we're seeing right here that is incredibly reminiscent of today? Question. The flood destroys all human and animal life. In the 600th year of Noah, Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the wellsprings of the great depth burst forth and the apertures of the skies opened up. There was rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and it took all of it together. It took one year and 11 days from the 17th of Cheshvan to the 28th of Cheshvan. The 11 days are the difference between the solar and the lunar year. So exactly a year. Here is the interesting thing. Why does God destroy? Why did God destroy his own creation? He created it. Why? Is it the way it is? Why, instead of making us good immediately, do we have to go through so much hardship and so much pain and so much misery? I'm talking about the Jewish people. And I'm talking about the world. And from day one, that is the case. From Adam and Eve to Cain and Abel, that is the case. And after the flood subsides and they go through everything else, the generation that comes up the other generation that comes up is again a generation of depravity what do we do we're going to build a city and we're going to go build a tower and we're going to take on hashem and we're going to take his power so how is it possible that a generation that knows about the flood, that knows about God's power to destroy the world, immediately follows and looks to destroy his world in their way and to immediately take back, take out God, take his power. How does that work? I haven't figured it out. I haven't figured it out. And I don't think anyone can totally understand what we're talking about. God makes a command again and he says okay the earth has dried up the dove has come back with an olive leaf it's time for you to go out into the world 
populate the world. I gave you everything. Now you can eat meat. Now you can eat vegetables. Now you're totally masters of the world. Everything belongs to you. And he establishes a covenant. So listen to this. God saw that Noah was scared to have children. So he said to Noah and to his sons who were with him, Look, I am setting up a covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you among the birds, the domesticated animals, the wild animals of the earth that walk with you, all those disgusting insects and reptiles who came out of the ark, all of the living creatures of the earth. In other words, what are we talking about? I'm making, says God, a covenant with the world. I will confirm my covenant with you that never again will any flesh be wiped out by flood waters and there will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is a sign of the confirmation of the covenant which I am placing between me and you and every living soul that is with you for all generations. This is not a small thing. This is you and me. This is all of us forever and ever. I have placed my rainbow in the cloud and it will be a sign of a covenant between myself and the earth. And then when I consider causing clouds of darkness and destruction to come upon the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds and I have the chills and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature amongst all flesh and the water will no longer become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow will be in the cloud and I will look at it to remember the everlasting covenant between God's attribute of judgment and every living creature among all flesh which is on the earth. Showing him a rainbow God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have set up between myself and all flesh on the earth. We look at a rainbow. Oh, look at this. Isn't it beautiful? Look at all the colors. Wow. Look at the rainbow. And you're not supposed to look at it. We're now going into the Zohar. 
and understand what he actually said, Hashem. I will look at it to remember my everlasting covenant. And I will not destroy the earth. And it will be a reminder for me that when my anger at you wants to destroy, instead, I will send a rainbow to remind myself of the covenant. There's something in Noah and something in this Parsha, which of course is relationship between him and his offspring, which is us. And when he says, I will establish my covenant with you and with the seed after you, we're talking about laws that came out. Excuse me. <sighs> Sorry. Laws that came out that are governing the world. And the Noahide laws are the seven commandments according to Jewish tradition that are incumbent on all mankind. Excuse me. Number one, to establish laws. Do not, number two, do not curse God. Number three, do not practice idolatry. Number four, do not engage in illicit sexuality. Number five, do not participate in bloodshed. Number six, do not rob. Number seven, do not eat flesh from a living animal. Sanhedrin 56a. Tosefat Avoda Zara 8 4. Genesis Rabba 34 8. There is a lot to be said for this because these are the laws of morality that guide the world. Or should I say, that should guide the world. Let it be said, let it be said, that if you look at these Noahide laws, and you live by them, whether you're Jewish, or whether you're not Jewish, or whether you are whatever, you're automatically assured a place in the world to come. That's how incredibly important they are. Let's talk about, let's talk about the rainbow. 
Now, when we see a rainbow, it is so incredibly important that we need to say a bracha, we need to say a blessing. And the blessing in English is blessed are you, ruler of the world, who remembers the covenant and who is faithful to his covenant and who stands by his word. In Hebrew, Baruch Atah Hashem Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Zocher Habrit Veneeman Bibrito Vekayam Bemaamaro Zohar, exact words. When, when do the patriarchs, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, become visible? When the rainbow betokens that the time of pruning has come, to wit, the time when the sinners are due to be cut off from the world and they only escape because blossoms, the patriarch, appear on earth. If not, for their appearance, the sinners would not be left in the world and the world itself would not exist. And who is it that upholds the world and causes the patriarchs to appear? Zohar, answer. It is the voice of tender children studying the Torah and for their sake, the world is saved. Uh, does that include children in public school? Does that include Jewish children that are not learning Torah, that are not going to Cheder, that are not being taught Torah? Where are the tender voices of the children studying Torah for which the world is being continued. Think about that. Section 171b, hence it is not permitted to gaze at the rainbow when it appears in the heavens as that would be disrespectful to the Shekhinah, that's the divine presence. The hues of the rainbow here below, below being a replica of the vision of supernal splendor, which is not for man's gaze. Hence, when the earth saw the rainbow as a holy covenant, it was once more firmly established and therefore God said, and it shall be for a token 
of a covenant between God, what we read before. The three primary colors and the one compound of them, which we mentioned before, are all one symbol and they all show themselves in the cloud. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of the throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. This alludes to the foundation stone, which is the central point of the universe and on which stands the Holy of Holies. The likeness of the throne, the supernal holy throne, possessing four supports and which is symbolic of the oral law. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man upon it above. This symbolizes the written law. So basically, comment, basically, forbidden to look. Why forbidden to look? Because you're looking at a divine manifestation. Fear, Volume 1, 72B. Do not expect the coming of the Messiah until the rainbow will appear, decked out in resplendent color which will illuminate the world. Only then expect the Messiah. We learned from this the words, and I will look upon it, that I will remember the everlasting covenant. This is at present the bow, appear in full colors, since it is only designed as a reminder that there shall be no return of the flood. And Rabbi Yehuda says, this is assuredly so, but the rainbow that appears in the sky has a profound Found mystic significance and when Israel will go forth from exile that rainbow is destined to be decked out in all its finery and its colors like a bride who adorns herself for her husband. We learn from the words and I will look upon it that I may Remember the everlasting covenant that it is at present the bow that appears in dull colors since it was only designed as a reminder but that it will appear in full color when it's time for Mashiach. The everlasting covenant will thus be remembered to be erased from the dust. My father also said that it is for the reason that in scripture the redemption of Israel and the remembrance of the rainbow are mentioned together as it is written, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I would not be 
angry with you nor rebuke you. Hashem has everlasting Rachmanut. His love for humanity, his love for his people, his love for his earth. That earth that is not governed by any chieftain in the skies, but only by Hashem himself. Hashem's eyes are upon the land from the beginning of the year until the end. Every moment and nothing and no power in heaven or earth will ever, ever take away that commitment that Hashem made to Noah. Do we understand that we have a commitment from God? But does God have a commitment from us? What would that look like in the world if that were indeed so? Would the Jewish people throughout history be suffering so? Would there be a conversation at the end of the Parsha of destroying again God? Taking away God's power. So what does he do? <laughs> what does he do? Since he has a covenant and he can't destroy, and he won't destroy another generation. He confounds them. He confounds their language. He confounds their voices. They can't talk to each other, so they can't build the tower, and they can't build the city, and they can't understand each other. So they go. That's us. Galut. Disbursement. All over the world. When do we come together? When the rainbow appears in its full color. And we can say the bracha, the blessing that Hashem has now opened up the full color of the rainbow. So the next time you look at the rainbow, remember, It is forbidden to a man to gaze upon a place which God loathes and even on one which God loves. Zohar, Vaikra, section 3, page 84b. For instance, it is forbidden to gaze upon the rainbow Chagiga 16a, because it is the mirror of the supernal form. It is forbidden to a man to gaze upon the size, upon the sign, sorry, of the covenant. Again, it is forbidden 
to a man to gaze upon the sign of the covenant upon him because it is emblematic of the righteous one of the world it is forbidden to gaze upon the fingers of the priests when he spreads out their hands to bless the congregation because the glory of the most high rests there is that clear so excuse me is that clear zohar vaika section 3 page 84b it is forbidden not maybe not yes oh how cute oh how nice oh look at all the colors i've done it i do it after the bra and it's incredible to see it and it's incredible to know what it means which now you do but here is the incredible incredible opening of your mind for what we talked about before regarding forbidden relations it is forbidden to a man to gaze upon the sign of the covenant upon him what are we talking about circumcision because this is emblematic of the righteous one of the world is this clear because i don't think i don't think that there is anything more clear than that There is not a parsha there is not a portion in the Torah that does not give us exact instruction that does not give us the way of life that does not open the door to us to total and complete understanding of why Hashem wants us to be who he wants us to be and when he gave us the blossom the patriarch to engage us to engage his world in chesed kindness Tyra and Mitzvah. He did so, so we learn, so we understand, and so we grow. And so the little children that are learning Tyra and keeping up the world continue to do so please please listen study take the parsha read it and understand in the simple words of a five-year-old what Hashem really wants from you, from me, from every Jew in this world, and from the world. Peace, blessing.
and love. Be well. Godspeed.